Welcome back. I hope you had an excellent break. Our next talk is a special topic, Imagine Code, Creating Code. It's always a, a really fun um, topic. So uh, welcome, Kirill Borisov. Hi, Kirill. Thank you. Hi. How so I am a little bit nervous. It's my first talk on a major conference and in totally in English. So fingers crossed, it will go not as awful as it could, but still. Don't, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> so where are you streaming from? I'm streaming straight from the Netherlands. It's quite rainy here and uh, weather could be nicer, but still, I like it here. Okay, great. So you're really talking about automatically generating code? Yes, uh, it's uh, my passion because I like everything code related and I try to create things that try to read and modify code in the spare time. So once I started doing that, I inev inevitably crashed right into the code generation. So let's okay, get started. Great. So let's get started. Thank you. Okay. So, greetings. I'm Kirill Borisov, and I have more than 15 years of programming experience under my belt. Uh, 10 of them are actually tightly mixed with Python. I'm creator of PyBetter Code Reformator and Black Connect PyCharm plugin. And as I've said, I'm in love with everything code. I like writing code, reading code, modifying code, fixing code, whatever. So, about this talk. What will you know from it? Uh, we will talk about how code is written. We will cover a little bit of parsing, so how it is translated into the, some machine level representation. We will introduce Hypothesis Meet, an excellent tool to do random Python code generation, and we'll dive a little bit deeper into how it actually works. How is it possible? So let's get started from a basic code. What is it really? Code is, uh, as you know, our bread and butter. Uh, we get paid to write code, to fix code of other people, to make it execute, to make it execute faster, etc. And code is usually written by hand, by uh, regular people. We have an idea, we translate it into paper, and then we translate it into the file in the computer, and then it magically gets to execute. But as we people are affordable, we also need not only to read it, but also check it. And we can't really trust other people to check it because as uh, I've said, we are fallible. We're just uh, mid-sex, we have emotions, we have uh, fatigue, etc. So the whole cottage industry of so-called linters appeared. It's uh, a set of tools, many of them that you know, that actually does uh, things like checking your code for complexity uh, and other things. Before we get uh, into them, let's Rem uh, remember how code is actually translated into a machine level representation. So here it is, maybe not the simplest possible program, but the simplest to understand and dear to everyone's heart, print hello world. But yes, it's a Python code, but how is it actually processed? First, it's broken down into so-called so tokens. Uh, as you can see, in this string, print is a token uh, of a type name. The left parenthesis and the right parenthesis and also semicolon are so-called op. And the hello world itself is a string. So as you can see, we already have some understanding in, about what actually goes into this string and uh, how this code is structured. But it's uh, too low level to do actually do anything useful for our uh, understanding. So when we apply the grammar, grammar describes how uh, the source code of a language is actually translated into high level structures that can be used to uh, process it into something that machine will understand. So here it is an excerpt of a Python free grammar that describes the top level structures, so-called file input, statement, simple statement, and small statement. As you can see in this context free grammar, we go down, so we have a statement. It can be either simple statement or compound statement. We go to the simple statement. It can be small statement, uh, separated by semicolons from other statement, one or more of them. And it is usually ended with a new line. 
And the small statement uh, in this turn can be one of the whole set of other types of statements like expression, print, del, and things like that. So if you combine the stream of tokens with a grammar, you'll get something like this. It's basically a low level structure that determines how a code is grouped. So as you can see, we have a file input that consists of end marker and simple statement. Simple statement is actually consists of power and the trailer and the new line. And all of them can be mapped directly onto the token stream. After that, the machine actually does some uh, transformations and creates so-called abstract syntax tree. That is actually the high level structure that interpreter works with to translate your code into a bytecode that gets executed by the interpreter. And this is a level at which most of the code checking, formatting, and modifying tool work at. Let's get back to the linters and auto formatters. So, as it has been mentioned, they read your code. And what they do is check your code style, they check your code for security issues, for the complexity issues, etc. Some can actually modify it and uh, introduce new constructions into it. Many of you know PEP8, PyFlakes, Black. Those are just uh, the most well-known examples of this uh, kind of tools. There are many, many more, and maybe some of you actually written some of them. But the question that gets to everyone who actually wrote at least one of those tools, how do you actually check them? So how to check the checkers? Uh, the usual way to go is to use handcrafted examples. So you try to imagine which kind of code will actually trigger the checks that I'm interested with and which kind will actually uh, do not trigger them. So you try to imagine as many permutations of these code examples as you can. When you write them down, when you say, hey, those should trigger the checks, those should not. And everything is OK, yes. And uh, for the most part, it's really OK. But in this, you are limited by your imagination. And code can be expressive tool uh, like no other. So imagine that someone writes code in a totally different way when uh, you are used to. Someone writes all their code in uh, one string, or someone uses eight uh, spaces instead of tabs, although it does seem a little bit crazy. And maybe, just maybe, your tool will break if it encounter code like that. Real world can really surprise you, and I know that from experience, sadly. So what can we do about that? Well, we can try to step outside of our head and uh, try to imagine how I can get the most random code possible. So what you can do is just take a random set of characters as an input and uh, filter them by the criteria, criteria that it actually compiles. And it will work, sure. But as anyone who read about Infinite Monkey Terror theory knows, it can take a really long time, like a lifetime of our universe even if uh, our computer was the size of the universe. I don't say that uh, it can't reach the uh, compilable example in your lifetime, or maybe even in a year, but still much too much for your regular CI build. So it is highly impractical in terms of time. And uh, sadly, it cannot really be used for our purposes. So what should we do? Well, here comes the tool called procedural generation. As Wikipedia tells, tells us, it's a method of creating data algorithmically. So we have some kind of algorithm which we can apply to a process of generating random data. So it's not completely random. It has some kind of structure inside it. And structure is the king. So what we need here is actually rules on how to arrange things inside the random code which we generate. We need some kind of patterns for generating things that are correct and valid for this uh, specific programming language. So for example, uh, identifiers should also all start with a letter. Doesn't mind which letter, but a letter still, etc. And it needs to cover the whole of the language. It wouldn't do if we cover only a specific subset of the language. 
if we are trying to go for broke and test something completely random, something that we'll never think of on our own, well, we'll need to try harder. And it does sound like a grammar, isn't it? Yes, it's actually uh, something that will help us. A grammar. Grammar is a structural representation of the things that can be in the language, how they can be arranged, how they should look if we are to be considered valid by the language itself. So we should really just go and use it. The grammar itself, as you have seen, can be represented as a tree. And the rules, so-called non-terminals, uh, will be a node of, it, of this tree. And the text, the actual uh, text that will go into the source code, so-called terminals, will be a leaf, uh, a leaf on this tree. So what we'll need to do is just do a random walk uh, through the tree, just go from the top of the tree down to the terminals, and just concatenate everything that we'll get from these leaves in order. And uh, with a high probability, we'll actually get code that will compile. To help us with that, we'll have a tool called Hypothesis. Many of you also probably used it already to generate tests or to generate data sets uh, for your tests. Using so-called property-based testing, it generates a wide range of input data. For example, if you have a function that accepts uh, two arguments, integers A and B, it will try to call them with zero, 100 million, minus one, Etc. Etc. It will not test the whole possible range of the values, and it's very important part. If we'll try to uh, test for the whole uh, possible range of values for a given data type, we will, may never end because uh, the integers they have a finite number of them, at least in computer uh, representation. But uh, imagine if we'll need to test all the possible strings uh, of characters that we can generate. Yeah, quite a long time, isn't it? So based on a quick check paper, uh, it what it does, it tries to generate examples and then tries to generate interesting examples. So it tries to move over the whole possible space of uh, values that can be used and try the ones that will pass uh, as approved by our tests. And then it will try to do so-called shrinking. Basically, if it finds a string of 1,000 million characters that breaks your test, it will try to make it uh, 1 million characters, uh, 10,000 characters, 1,000 characters, etc., just because it's much easier to represent and then reproduce. To do that, it uses so-called hill climbing search, which is outside of the scope of this talk. Basically, it's uh, a method to actually navigate this uh, many dimensional space of possible values. So just an example, uh, we'll use something from the hypothesis documentation. It's a test that checks uh, that we actually can create a file with all the possible branch names for some kind of repository. So we have a valid branch names function that uses the thing called strategy that is supported by hypothesis to actually generate random text. We specify the restrictions on that random set of characters. It should consist of uh, only of the letters, alphabetical letters. It should have minimum size one and maximum size uh, 112. Also, they should all be lowercase, or uh, we can also taste the specific case of a master branch. And then hypothesis will take our test function, test check out new branch, and we'll try to generate uh, branch names and give it one by one. Possibly some of them uh, will pass. Maybe uh, some of them will break the invariant and actually break the test as well. And that is actually what it do. But on itself, hypothesis cannot really generate uh, the random source code using its simple strategies like text mentioned here. To help us with generating source code for a specific language, we need to use more advanced thing uh, in the hypothesis called Lark strategy. Lark strategy actually uses a Lark parser. It's a parsing toolkit for Python. 
that uh, you fit in the context uh, free grammar and it generates the code to actually parse the source code described by this grammar into some kind of a representation. So uh, Lux strategy basically takes a uh, grammar, in our case, Python free grammar. It generates uh, its representation in the machine readable format, basically a tree. And then what Lux strategy does, it's basically walks the tree and on each level, it selects a subset of the nodes on this level and uh, walks into them. And it does that recursively until it reaches the terminals. And the terminals, the actual thing that will be generated and included in our source code, will be represented as a regex. And it will try to take a regex and generate a string that will actually uh, be matched by that regex. And then it will be considered as an acceptable terminal. But not all languages can be uh, generated like that on a whim, because Python is very quirky. As you know, for example, aside from many different languages, it uses indentation to mark blocks of code instead of a pairs of parentheses. Or, for example, identifiers must be UTF-8 encodable. Otherwise, uh, the compiler the interpreter will not recognize them as valid. And there is a lot of AST post-processing. So the code that is described by the Python 3 grammar is not necessarily the code that will be recognized as valid by the Python interpreter itself, because it will do a lot of post-processing on what is actually generated. Or for example, we have a new PAG parser in Python 3.10 that will actually uh, do interesting things, which is again at the scope of this talk, but we can talk for hours uh, about it. If you're interested, you can read a series of posts by uh, Guido Van Rossum, in which he walks you through writing the simplest possible uh, PHG parser for Python itself. So, to help us with this, there is a tool called Hypothesmeet. So it is inspired by the SysMeet. The SysMeet is actually a tool that has been used by the researchers to test the C compilers for bugs. It uh, generates valid and random uh, C programs. And why not do that for Python, for the creator of this tool? And what it does, it exposes the strategy that can be used with uh, hypothesis, so it builds on the large strategy. And that strategy has a number of post-processing mechanisms that smooth over all, all the quirks in the Python uh, code that we can generate. So for example, it uh, post-processes the generated code in terms of uh, idents, generating the correct ones. It also tries to compile each example by the Python compiler and then throws away the ones that actually do not compile, although they are valid from the grammar standpoint. And also has an experimental support for per node generation. So instead of generating uh, any possible program uh, that can include any possible uh, subset, uh, all the productions in the Python grammar, you can ask it to generate only uh, if expressions in all the possible forms or imports, etc., It is a little bit uh, experimental, in my opinion, at this point, and it uses libcst, but it has a big potential, in my opinion. So how does it actually look in practice? So let's look at this uh, source code. This source code uses hypothesis uh, to generate our source code. But first, we are setting a special set of uh, options for the generation of the random examples by hypothesis because generating source code examples can be very slow. Not slow like a uh, lifetime of a universe, but slow as uh, five, 10 minutes. And by uh, default, hypothesis will say that no, this test, uh, test takes too long, I will just fail it. So we tell them that no, there is no deadline, take as long as you can, and do not uh, look at the high number of discarded examples, because uh, as we've said, 
quite a lot of examples that will be generated will not actually be compilable. But the actual meat of the matter you can be see uh, in the next test. It's a generated uh, source parameter that passed to the test, and it's generated from hypothesis dot from grammar. We are also telling uh, it to generate a maximum of 1,000 examples just for the sake of a demonstration. And instead of checking this code for anything, we'll just try to print it out to see what is actually being generated by hypothesis. So in the beginning, it will be something quite simple. So a new line, perfectly valid uh, Python source code. Two new lines, okay, I can write that. New line, a new line, okay. If a Oh my God, with A, oh my God. But there are spaces here. There are like no spaces here. Is it really a valid Python code? Actually, it turns out, yes. I, for myself, will not uh, in any way consider any Python programmer a person who will write without any white spaces because it's actually hostile to other people. But uh, for purposes of testing, this is exactly what we need, because as I've said before, we need something what we people will not consider to be possible or even needed. And if you give it some time, it will graduate to more complex examples like this. Yes, again, perfectly valid Python source code. It does look a little bit strange, but it will compile. And it will actually uh, trigger some bugs possibly in your code because did you ever uh, imagine that there can be no white spaces in your code as well or that non-local variable names can be a set of Unicode characters, not only ASCII ones, et cetera, et cetera. And if you give it some time, it will generate something completely unreadable, but still, it's a valid Python source code and it's still valid for purposes of testing. Maybe exactly this will uncover some bug in your parser code. Or maybe your tool will choke on this and you will know that, hey, something went wrong. I need at least to see if it's actually applicable to the regular code written by humans or not. To help with a better example generation, Hypothesmith also use so-called targeted search feature of a hypothesis. So we use metrics to find better examples to guide the search for the random data in the space of all possible examples. The targets as used by hypothesis, by hypothesis means, it's a number of bytecode instructions, total number of AST nodes in the resulting source code tree, and the number of a unique AST node types. So for example, uh, if we have a program generated that has like 1000 print instructions, then possibly we need to do something to make it more varied in terms of what constructions go into the generated code. So by using these targets, hypothesis will move through this space and generate longer and more complicated uh, code, which is a nice uh, feature to have. So you will say, are there any actual bugs found by hypothesis? Yes, and uh, as you can see from this list, and this is not a complete list, the bugs that it found can actually be traced uh, to the Python interpreter itself, for example, Python per sec fault, which actually stopped the release of Python 3.9 alpha 1. And uh, sec fault, as you may well know, is very, very uh, serious matter because basically it breaks everything. There was also a tokenized, untokenized around three bugs. So for some reason, if uh, given a specific uh, example of code, if you give it to tokenize and give the resulting string of to tokens to untokenize, it will not generate the same text that was passed to the tokenize, which is again, not what was expected of the code itself. There's also uh, issues in the more well-known packets like lib223, black, libcst. And uh, I do think that if you try it on your code, on your tool, you may find a bug as well. For example, I came to know about Hypothesmith when its creator actually came <laughs> to one of my projects and said, hey, your tool does not process uh, this specific piece of code correctly. And I'm like, 
like where where did you get this nobody writes code like that and then uh, i discovered hypothesis and yes and uncovered a serious bug in my tool and i had to fix it because while you may say this example was far-fetched the one that was generated uh, and looks mostly like gibberish it still could have impacted more unusually written code by actual human being so as i said there are some caveats to this approach uh, most generated code is gibberish as you've seen for yourself and it can only serve as a smoke test smoke test is a term that comes from electrical engineering it's basically when you've assembled some kind of a device and you plug it uh, to a power source and uh, if everything is assembled correctly nothing happens except for maybe it's not working as you've expected but if you for example made some errors and there's a short circuit you will see smoke coming out of some parts of your circuit and that indicates that something went wrong and you should really look closely to what you have done and uh, here it serves the same purpose so it will crash your code possibly in a place you never expected it to and that will serve as an impetus to actually look into what is going on and does it actually trigger a real world bug and uh, do you need to fix it or not if you haven't done that possibly it could have snagged uh, under the hood and triggered something bad happening in the real world there's actually no support for ast post-processing as well as i mentioned uh, many of the code examples that otherwise can be considered valid from a grammar standpoint will be thrown away because uh, we do not have a specific understanding of how to generate code that will trigger those post-processing rules but uh, it is an area for improvement and possibly one day this tool or some hour will actually look into that problem and learn how to do that and it will improve the efficiency of uh, generating process considerably also it can be quite slow mostly because it will uh, spend some time searching for examples that are actually compilable uh, due to the previous point and many of them will be thrown away and it can take quite a lot of time especially since uh, if you try to compile any type of code that you've generated it will take resources needed to parse this, to process this, transform this, and in the end uh, to determine that it's actually compilable. So if you are really interested in this, and I may understand if you're not, but uh, for those who are, you can read a little bit uh, more to understand how it is actually works and how it can be applied further. First, I would highly recommend uh, two papers, Finding and Understanding Bugs in C Compilers that describes the SysMeet and how it actually works. Next is a quick check. It's uh, basically a property-based testing tool that described in this paper in Haskell. Yes, I know Haskell. But still, it uh, gives all the necessary base in of information for you to understand how this random example generation is actually guided, how it works, and how it can be applied to your program. And always there is a very famous book, Compilers, Principles, Techniques, and Tools by Aho Sethi and Ullman, that is considered to be the textbook on the parsing techniques, on how to write your own parser for any language that comes into your mind. It's a little bit hefty, like 1,000 something, 200, 100 uh, pages, but still it's a very gripping read and I cannot recommend it enough. And also, if you're really just interested into how to apply random testing to your code, then you can also uh, look into the articles that describe the hypothesis. And specifically, a good starting point is the high hypothesis works on its website to better understand uh, what you can do to improve the efficiency of a code generation and how it can be applied to your specific test situation so any questions thank you very much kirill for your first talk at the big conference it was very good so um 
There is one question. We, are, we don't really have too much time, but I still ask this question. Will Hypothesis and other tools mentioned here work in Python 3.1 only peg? That's a very good question. So uh, technically they would, because we're using the Python grammar which, that is not attached to a specific parsing method used by the Python interpreter. Uh, as I've said, uh, it actually triggered some bugs in the peg parser already. So we can say that it works. And uh, I think that maybe some problems will come further uh, if we dive into the creation of a code examples that trigger the code transformation and specific peg uh, parser features later. But at this moment, it uses uh, on the grammar to generate code samples. So you are good. Okay, so unfortunately we are uh, out of time, but if there are more questions, I'm sure you can check the chat. So sure. Thanks again. Thank you and, for having me. And maybe see you at the physical conference next year or fingers crossed. You know, fingers crossed, yes. Okay. Okay, so our next talk has a very...